Friends, I'm so excited to begin this Honest Advent journey. I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but before we get into that, I wanna uh, start with our scripture reading. Our first reading is just gonna be one verse from Isaiah 9, 6. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests on his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then we're going to turn to uh, Matthew's gospel, the very beginning of it, the genealogy, because it is Advent. And what would be better in Advent than to begin with reading a genealogy where I may or may not pronounce all of the names correctly? Verse 1, an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron was the father of Aram. And Aram was the father of Animadad, and Animadad was the father of Nanshan, and Nanshan was the father of Salmon, and Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. So that's the first six verses. It continues on for another uh, 10 or 11 verses, but I want to jump down to the end of it. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the Uh, deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. May God add blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. Friends, as we get started, I just want you to think about all that's happened in the last week. As you've celebrated Thanksgiving, what was good? What was a blessing? What was stressful? What was challenging and what was fulfilling? What was joy-filled and what really drained you? How many miles did you travel or did others travel to to be with you? How many calories did you eat? Awkward conversations did you have with Aunt Marge? How many minutes did you laugh over the last week? Did you get any sleep? How many boxes of traditions did you unpack or did you check, depending on how you want to think about that phrase? How many stories did you tell? How many did you hear? How many stories did you make this year? A lot has happened in the last week. We come into the holiday time where a lot happens almost every week uh, between now and Christmas and then even on a little bit past that. We're in this season, friends. Welcome to Advent. I want you to think back on last week's message. I talked a little bit about Christ the King Sunday and, and how we're wrapping up the church's liturgical calendar. Uh, We're in a new year now. This is the first Sunday of a new year. And so we've already sort of begun that process. But remember last week, we said that Christ the King is about declaring the power and the might and the glory and the majesty and the honor and praise of Christ. That, That he is the one that we worship, that we put as Lord over our life, that we give all of our worship to him. We say that Christ is above all and in all and through all. That he is the Lord of light for the world that he is to be praised above anything else. He is the name above every name. He is the chief um, direction point for our lives. And like the Ark of the Covenant in 1 Chronicles chapter 16 that we read last week, uh, like the Ark was for the people of God, Christ is for us the central defining point of our identity. We are who we are because Christ is who Christ is. And Christ has claimed us and named us. And Christ is King and Lord over all. Give honor and praise and thanksgiving for that. That's what we talked about last week. And just like so much has happened in the last week of your life in the midst of this holiday season, In the church calendar, so much has changed. We turn our attention from the triumphal joy uh, of, of what we celebrate on Christ the King Sunday to the suspense and the anticipation and the waiting that comes with Advent. We talk about light and glory and wonder, and then we talk about moving into the darkness and the stillness and the quiet. We go from envisioning God on a throne with a crown, uh, robed in all sorts of light and beauty, to to preparing to envision him as a child, completely helpless, dependent, needy, crying, and vulnerable. Welcome, friends, to Advent. Advent is a time where we're encouraged to to reimagine our understanding of God and to revisit uh, what our look at the world or our perspective on the world is. As we enter Advent, we're moving into the thick of a season 
where the days get shorter and the darkness gets longer and the world gets a little bit colder and quieter. We're invited into reflection, invited into prayer, invited into waiting, waiting on God, waiting on something new. We're invited out of certainty, out of platitudes, out of our self-assuredness, and into honest vulnerability. Welcome to Advent. In many ways, uh, I was talking to Pastor Nanette about this. Uh, in many ways, I, I think of Advent as an invitation to sort of suspend all of the, the confidence and certainty that we hold on to. Uh, what, what the church calendar invites us to do by starting in this way is to say that we enter into the wilderness and we enter into the, the darkness waiting on God to meet us there. Well, we've been talking about this year of the story and we talk about what it means to live stories. We also talk about the stories that, that impact us. That was the Voices series that, 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 that shape us and, and how other people do that, uh, we, we can also think about the stories that, that we consume. And that's not a bad thing. I don't say that as a bad thing, but the, the, the books that we read, uh, the movies that we watch, the things like, like that, that, they are powerful and important for us. And oftentimes what happens is we go uh, to, to, to consume one of these stories in order to short, sort of uh, push out the world that is around us. It's not good. It's not bad. We just, we just sort of suspend what's going on around us and, 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 and enter into that story. Sometimes we have to suspend more than others. When you watch a, a sci-fi movie or an action thriller, oftentimes we have to suspend even uh, fundamental elements of, of reality or how we understand the world works in order uh, to, to really enter into the story. Sometimes we just get to escape by, by hearing a, a true biography or, or something uh, of somebody that, that, that's lived a compelling and interesting life. And so we dive into it that way. In many ways, I, I think about Advent as that same thing. What we do is we suspend the reality, the truth that, that we know uh, that God is with us at all times. And we enter into the waiting and, and we don't do it just for the heck of it. We do it because there are times in life where we feel like we're waiting and it's painful and it's difficult. There are times where we feel like God is far away or has, has turned away from us. And Advent is a time where we uh, learn and train ourselves as we, as we suspend uh, some of uh, our other activities, as we enter into reflection, we grow and we learn just like we do from stories so that we might be shaped into new people. So this year, as we journey through these five weeks uh, until Christmas, uh, we're going to have Scott Erickson as our guide. And, and Scott is an artist who, who created a, a book and, and created art uh, for this book called Honest Advent, which invites us to uh, awaken to the wonder of God with us then, here, and now. The book is, the book is really incredible. Now, I'm, I'm pretty iffy about Advent devotionals as a, as a general rule. I, I don't get all that excited about them. But friends, this book... This book is fantastic. I picked it up last year and it's 25 days. So you're supposed to read like one each day in December leading up to, to Christmas. And quite frankly, uh, I, I think I read the whole book in about 24 hours because I was so enthralled by it. I want to encourage you to, to pick up a copy of it. You can buy it online uh, for a little bit more. We have uh, $10 copies at the church if you want to pick one up during the week or on a Sunday morning. But I would encourage you to get one to write in it, to, to look at the artwork, and we'll take opportunities to show you some of the art. Uh, speaking of which, actually also, at, um, in the Grace Gathering Room where we worship, we've put up a sort of art show where we have uh, about 15 poster-sized versions of the art that's in the book. And if you want to come and spend some time in reflection and quiet reflection during the week or, or some other time, I definitely check it out on a Sunday morning. But if you want to come at another time, I would be happy to, to, to let you in so that you can just spend some time reflecting. reflecting. Anyway, that's, that's the book that, that we're looking at. And, and I think it's going to be a real blessing that's also going to guide all of our reflections in this season. So, so we've got that artwork available. We've got the book available. I would invite you to, to, to um, get a hold of it one way or another. And I would invite you to take his invitation to enter Advent with honesty and with vulnerability. Uh, much of what we're talking about this week is vulnerability, our willingness to be open and dependent and raw and honest, our ability to let our guard down. Vulnerability is not something that we usually embrace. In fact, if we're honest, we, we, we are far more quick to turn away from it, to run away from it. We'd rather skip over all of the, the songs in minor key that we're supposed to sing in Advent before we get to deck the halls and jingle bells. We don't like the, the heaviness that comes with being vulnerable. 
It's uncomfortable. And also, sometimes we witness, and sometimes we probably per- participate in manufactured vulnerability, because we know there's a power in vulnerability, right? Uh, it's only in vulnerability that love can happen. In the space uh, between, in the space of openness, it's only uh, in that place that, that real strong relationships can build. It's only in that place that, that I believe that we can experience the redemption that God wants us to experience, that we can experience whole, wholeness and healing. Uh, we have to be vulnerable. We have to be open. We have to be raw in order to experience any of those things. But it feels so unnatural to us. So sometimes we just pretend. Sort of like sometimes we pretend everything's fine at Christmas. We pretend like we're happy because we think we're supposed to be. We pretend like we've got it all figured out when inside That's not the case. This year's Advent is an invitation uh, into a a, a different kind of honesty and vulnerability so that we might experience Christmas a little bit better. So we know that vulnerability is not our strong suit, but we know it's where creativity happens. We know it's in that gap that, that there is energy and love and possibility and healing. So I want you to think for just a moment about when it was that you felt most vulnerable in your life both for for good and and maybe in a challenging way. So maybe two times where you felt particularly vulnerable. And his uh, in his book Erickson talks about the the life cycle of vulnerability that we have. As in we have it all throughout our lives. We begin our, our journey completely dependent. We have no power of our own. Uh, we we don't even know what we want or what we need, let alone how to express uh, what we want or need when we are an infant. That's how a child comes out. They are completely vulnerable and completely dependent. And then then we grow. Eventually, we grow into adolescence, where, where everything we thought we knew about ourselves and about others and about relationships in the world, all of it just gets blown up. That's basically what happens in adolescence. Insecurity uh, abounds as the ground feels like it shakes underneath us. And then slowly as time progresses, you, you get a little better, um, a little better footing on, on your calling and your purpose and what it means to be connected and interrelated to one another and relationships and finances, and you get some stability maybe and well, does all your vulnerability come in one of those spaces? When it, was it when you were a young child in your adolescence? When did you feel most vulnerable? And when you think you've got a handle on things, you hit your midlife, all of a sudden jobs change abruptly, expectations evolve, you see marriages around you fall apart, children uh, come in and they remind you that you know absolutely nothing. That's my current, le- current stage in life. Uh, your body eventually starts to change again and, and perhaps fail you. You find yourself saying things that that your parents said. And maybe worst of all, the music that you grew up listening to is no longer on the hits channel, but now it's on like a classic channel or something like that. You know what I'm talking about? Was it in the the midlife that you experienced uh, the most vulnerable that you've ever been? Children then move out and move on and careers come to a close. And suddenly, 20 years later, we're not even sure who we are or what our identity is anymore. Our bodies grow a a bit more fragile and and an awareness of what is beyond uh, begins to grow and we become preoccupied a little bit more with that, whether we're certain about it or uncertain. We realize that culture and time and society move at a faster pace than we can and perhaps faster pace than we care to keep up with. And if we live long enough, we may find ourselves a little bit a little bit more aware of our vulnerability as we become weak and dependent and almost as needy as we were when we were first born, except with more awareness, probably, of what's needed and lacking. Is it the sunset season of life, however many years you want to define that as, that feels most vulnerable to you? This, in and of itself, is a worthwhile reflection as we seek to, to tap into some of that vulnerability as we go into Advent, I want us to, to sit in that uneasiness. I want us to sit in that discomfort because I believe Advent invites us to do that and to find that on the other end of it, God meets us right there where we are, that healing meets us right there where we are, that possibility and hope and, and, and restoration meets us right in the midst of that. In and of itself, this is a worthwhile activity. It's also important in the midst of a Christmas season in which we are far too inclined to tinsel up everything, make it shiny, 
nanny and just say everything is fine. We, we see uh, parents dragging their children from one activity to another or into church and, and saying, uh, you will be happy. You will enjoy this. And, and nobody's having fun. In this season, we often want to project more than we do any other time of year this misnomer that everything is all right and we have it under control. So in and of itself, reminding ourselves of our vulnerability in the times where for better and maybe for worse, we felt most vulnerable is an important and worthwhile reflection. And I want to go even deeper than that. As we enter into Advent, there's another uh, reflection that is just astounding to me. When we talk about this whole life cycle of vulnerability and all the different ways that we feel it, it is mind-boggling to me to think that Jesus experiences some of these very same stages of vulnerability. From having to have his diaper changed and to eat at the breast of Mary to having to flee for his life long before he had any awareness of what was going on to that awkward adolescence. Jesus doesn't get a, a get-out-of-jail-free card. He doesn't have a floating angelic aura. He lives and has relationships and losses and challenges. He comes real human to be with us, to dwell with us, to walk with us, to experience rejection and loss. He must have one heck of a coming-of-age story But friends, it begins in true, honest, flesh and bone vulnerability. And that is mind-blowing. I don't want us to to rush past that. I don't want us to need uh, Jesus to be in perfect condition when he comes out there in the manger. He wasn't. That's not how babies come out. Jesus comes out dependent and needy and struggling to two new parents who, if their experience is anything like mine, have no earthly idea what they're doing. So all those vulnerabilities that you just thought of in your life, Jesus stepped into that reality and may have experienced some of the very same things that you did. And all of that fascinates me because we read these words of Isaiah at the opening, uh, not only of the sermon, but at the opening of the service as we lit our, our hope candle. And we said that this child comes as wonderful counselor and mighty God. I just want to stop there. Wonderful counselor and mighty God. And I just wonder, does this infant, fresh from his mother, offer us a new perspective on what it means for God to be a mighty God? just want us to think about that as we enter into this, as we name our own vulnerabilities, as we open up, as we come into this process. Like I said, this book is going to challenge you to be very vulnerable, to look at Jesus uh, very honestly, and to, to pull back some of the veneer that sometimes we want to put on this Christmas story. I think that if we do that, we'll be impacted so much for the better. I want to say one other thing that I think about when I think about the vulnerability of, of Jesus. Each year, I think about people who struggle in the holiday season because of their families. There is a vulnerability that comes with being around people who know almost everything about you, who know about you way back at the beginning, things that, that you, you just hope that you just wish that you could magically make them forget. Nobody else knows them, but your family does. There's an uneasiness that accompanies the the ease with which we can communicate when you're in a place where uh, everybody knows what buttons to push and can also finish your sentences. Sometimes that feels uncomfortable. And sometimes that's for no particular reason. Sometimes it's because of drama or trauma that we've experienced in life. But I think about just all of the vulnerability that comes when we get back with our family and it feels like the further extended you get, the more vulnerable it can feel. And here's why this is important. Jesus was born into a family. And I don't just mean Jesus, uh, Mary and Joseph, but this time of year, we, we talk about genealogies and we like to read genealogies. Okay, that's not true. Nobody likes to read genealogies. I, I, I did the first third of it today. You can read all of it right at the beginning of Matthew's gospel if you want, but, but we sometimes read those in this season because we think there's some importance to it. Now, Sort of like an obituary, when you read uh, those who have survived the the deceased and and those who uh, preceded them in death, uh, oftentimes those lists look very, well, very tame, very orderly, very structured. 
and we can read through them pretty, pretty quickly. You can even do that in Matthew's gospel, though you might trip over some of the names. Everything looks very orderly. In fact, Matthew wants it to be orderly. He structures it in such a way that there was 14 generations of people from Abraham until they were sent into exile. I'm sorry, until David and then David, until exile and then exile until Jesus came. And he says that in that last part that I read, Matthew does. He wants it to all be good and orderly. But here's the deal, friends. Family never is good and orderly. That's what I've, I've determined. It's never as clean cut as we project or as we want it to be. So if you really dive into those names, there's a lot of stories happening there. And Matthew basically got to pick who he included in that list because there's a little bit of um, author's discretion maybe as he's writing that. And so there are affairs and murders. Uh, There are losses and griefs. There is, is war. There's failure and sin and folly and redemption and forgiveness and restoration. I mean, these names represent real people and real lives, and you can read about many of them in the scriptures. And what you'll find is that they were a messy group of people, actually probably a lot messier even than your family. So it's all a little bit more nuanced than we give it credit for. There's unexpected joy and pain in the genealogy And it's into that family, that reality, that line of brokenness and of joy and of redemption and of following God and of sin and of turning away and getting things right and doing things wrong. It's into that family that Jesus comes. It's right into the mess and the brokenness, right into the incompleteness and the unknown that Jesus steps. He doesn't come in veneered and perfect and ready to project an image that everybody can sing hallelujah chorus to. He comes as a vulnerable child into a family that's really messed up. God doesn't shy away from that vulnerability. And I don't think we should either. Even more than Jesus' DNA, he steps into a family system that knows dysfunction. Says Erickson of this text, Matthew is honest about the family that Jesus is birthing into a real human family and refreshingly relatable to us today. We are a culmination of holy moments and juicy moments. You know what you know. And this paradox of our interior genealogy is what we carry into the season of Advent, wondering if Christ could come into our complicated midst as well. And friends, the answer is yes. So all those vulnerabilities that come from family or from those seasons in life that you've named, I want you to hold on to them. I want you enter, to enter into this season knowing that you might not have all of the answers and being willing to ask the questions and being willing to sit and wait and to see what God might say in the midst of it. This is our invitation to honesty, to wonder, to wait and trust. This is our invitation to Advent. I want to read one final bit from Erickson's book. I think these words are powerful and I think they'll give us something to reflect on. What does it say about a God who's willing to be this vulnerable with us? Who's willing to come into this world through the statistical risk of childbearing? Who's willing to be attached to a placenta for nourishment and life in God's own creation? What does it say about a God who's willing to wait and grow in the human womb? Who's willing to be fearfully and wonderfully made just like we are? Any real connection involves vulnerability because it takes the act of making oneself open to truly be known. God came to us floating in embryonic fluid, slowly forming and taking shape, embedded in the uterine wall of a Middle Eastern teenage woman God trusted to care for the fragile knitting process. What does it say about a God like this? What it says about a God who's willing to be this vulnerable is that God is willing to open up and deeply connect with us. The real question is, are we willing to do the same? That's our invitation, friends. Welcome to Advent.